I know we're going to now move to the to our plenary panel to hear about Ukraine's agriculture sector will be rebuilt. I'm wondering if our friends are here or not. I suspect they are. Just give us one minute while we get get them on stage. One second. Thank you, Ambassador McKee. That was awesome. Can we give Ambassador McKee another round, please? Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Shannon Hertzfeld. Thank you very much for coming here um, to hear about Ukraine agriculture. Um, as I said, my name's Shannon Hertzfeld. I'm a senior associate here at CSIS uh, as part of their program on prosperity and development. Um, this morning, I'm going to ask each panelist to, oh, and, and Vasily is here too. Um, I'm going to ask each panelist to give a very brief introduction, um, and then we're going to jump right into the issues of what does rebuilding Ukraine agriculture look like, and what are the opportunities, and what are the challenges. So let me start by introducing our panelists today. Um, I'm just going to go straight down here. Next to me is Timothy Malovino. Wait, Malovinov. Perfect. Thank you. So that's when I'll just, I'll stop right there. No, Tim, Timothy is the, the president of the Kiev School of Economics um, and former minister of economy, trade, and agriculture, and has come to us today from uh, Ukraine. And so I'm going to ask you, when you get your water set, to give us a little short introduction of who you are. And please say, why, why did you come here today? Uh, I came here because Eddie Mar uh, Edward Marshall told me to come. So, you know, <laughs> those of you who know. Him. And he sets me up with donors, you know, generally in the U.S. So I do what he says. You know. Well, you <laughs> But know. That's, that's the real story. The official story, of course, is that uh, it's a privilege to be here and speak to the audience. Uh, this is an esteemed think tank, influential, and for us in Ukraine at the Kiev School of Economics, it's an important part of growth, actually, to interact and debate and discuss. And there's truth to both stories, I think, yeah. yeah. I'm president of the Kiev School of Economics, and you know, that's it. Well, Thank you. Thank you, and we're Oh, yeah, I was a minister of um, economy, economy, trade, trade and, and agriculture, agriculture. Yeah, in 2019, 2020, and I did a land market reform in Ukraine, which was stalled for 20 years by mm -hmm. oligarchs. So uh, there, there's some background on agriculture mm -hmm. in my portfolio. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, next to him is Dennis Bashlik. Uh, he is the Deputy Minister of Agriculture and um, came to us also today from Ukraine. If you could take a moment, could you tell us a little bit about your background and again, why are you here today? Yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, I'm a Deputy Minister of Agriculture for Digitalization and Other Process. It's formally, but in fact, I'm working with a lot of issues like the mining, like investments, like logistics, like export, etc. If we speak about my background, uh, also I uh, was head of State Geocadastra, it's a land agency in Ukraine, and I uh, supported Timofey in conducting land reform in 2020. Uh, why I'm here today, uh, probably uh, not because of donors. <laughs> uh, I'm here to emphasize... Job. I'm president of yeah. my university, my yeah. job is donors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, uh, I'm here to emphasize on the importance of, of Ukraine's agriculture in, uh, uh, during the war and uh, in the process of rebuilding Ukraine uh, after our victory. And also, uh, frankly speaking, I'm here for, to help, to assist, to shift the perception that Ukraine is a charity project in agriculture. We are a reliable business partner, and I want to show that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dennis. Next to him is Jim Prokopanko. And like many people in global agriculture, I think you started out at Cargill and learned the ropes, uh, but then went on to Mosaic, a powerhouse uh, in global fertilizer. So please tell us a little bit more about yourself, Jim, Thank you. and why you're here today. Yeah, I've uh, um, spent 35 years in um, agriculture, either buying grain from farmers, selling them the fertilizer, chemical seed inputs, 
uh, initially in Canada, where I'm from, and then uh, around the world, uh, principally in Asia, Latin America, and, and some European, uh, Eastern European business. Uh, so I've got a real affinity for this subject of uh, number one, Ukraine, both grandparents, both sides of the family, came from the Ukraine in 1913 to Canada, and I left a perfectly good country, moved to, migrated to the U.S. with work, and reside there. Uh, presently, I'm retired. I serve on a number of uh, corporate boards, and that keeps me busy. Why I'm involved with this CSIS group, uh, it's the importance of this topic, um, to the importance to global food and global food security. Uh, second, the enormity of this task to reposition rebuild Ukrainian agriculture is a monumental task. And third, the tremendous opportunity this is going to provide for world global food security and to the country of the Ukraine and the people of the Ukraine. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Next, next to Jim is Peter Zazok. Did I get that right? Close enough. Okay. Um, and Peter comes to us from an iconic agriculture company known as John Deere. I don't know if you have to wear a green hat all the time when you're working. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that the fact that John Deere truly is a global country, a company rather, um, indicates the reach of American agriculture throughout the world. Uh, I would like, we're, we're very pleased to have Peter here though, because his day job is in part to keep the Ukrainian farmer serviced happy and part of the John Deere larger uh, corporate legacy. So could you talk a little bit about your background and why you're here today? And thank you for coming. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to talk to you on behalf of John Deere. My name is Peter Sachse, German. That's why it's tough to pronounce. <laughs> I am 15 years with the company. All the time in the CIS, I have a real favor uh, and passion for that. And uh, I had also the privilege to live from 2014 just until prior to the war in Ukraine and can share with you it's a fantastic country. I only can recommend uh, to see it. And in this context, I also would like to share with you, and that's the reason why I'm here, that Ukrainian agriculture is still operating on a very high level. The war could not influence to this extent on the uh, productivity as it was anticipated. The Ukrainian agriculture has especially in this situation proven to be a powerhouse. And I hope we can also talk in this uh, round here how modern agriculture in Ukraine already is. Thank you, thank you. And lastly with us today is Vasily Barbaroy. Uh, he's coming to us remotely, uh, but we are very pleased to have him. Vasily joins us. He is with Cargill, uh, and he is the regional manager for Ukraine. But he also has a few other co companies in your portfolio, countries in your portfolio, like Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Italy. So, please join us, Vasily. Say hello and tell us a little bit more about yourself and why you are joining us. Can, can you hear? No. Good morning, I think it's uh, very afternoon here. Uh, I'm very happy to be, uh, to be with you today. And uh, obviously, I'm looking forward for, uh, for a very interesting session. Uh, you, I, I would start uh, when talking about Ukraine. I think the first thing I want to say is that I have a deep sense of admiration for the resilience of Ukrainian people. And I, I think uh, uh, everybody is talking a, a lot about uh, the heroic uh, the defense that the army uh, is, uh, is putting. But uh, for me, it's at least as impressive is the resilience of the normal Ukrainian people. Uh, it, it's something really that deserves a lot of admiration. Now, um, when uh, when it comes to our activities on uh, the ground, um, the, the office uh, the beginning of the 90s, so we are more than 30 years uh, active in the country. And one thing has been always clear to us and will stay clear is that uh, Ukraine is uh, it's a very uh, important part of our business. It always has been, and I'm more than sure that it will continue. 
Sorry for that. I uh, my network is not really strong uh, uh, today. Uh, can you hear? Uh, can you hear me better now? Oh, that's a little bit. No, uh, long, long story, short discussions. No. Okay, we'll just grab you in. Uh, I hope it stays. Back. And just put your yeah, hand up if you, you want to intervene, because uh, that's what uh, everybody else here will do. So thank you very much. Um, I think we should start off by stepping back and seeing what does Ukraine agriculture look like today? Clearly, Ukraine is known as a breadbasket, an area that is endowed with enormous amounts of very good soil and high productivity of the land. Um, we've also heard, though, both with, through the press and through some discussions here, that perhaps 30%, maybe even a bit more of the land right now is encumbered with mines and chemical contamination. Uh, I think many of, of us were pleased to read that the FAO and the World Food Program announced in early June a $100 million program called Safe Farms. I know that Cargill is, is a participant, I've learned, in this program. Uh, and while that is exciting to hear that is ongoing, I would like to hear from people whose boots are on the ground, how much at this point when we're going into harvest, is there active demining, decontamination going on? What, what does it look like? Are we, are we getting to a better spot or is it still largely encumbered with the uh, elements of war? So to Dennis, to Peter, to Vasily, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, actually you're right. Unfortunately, Ukraine uh, today is the most contaminated uh, country with the mines and other explosives. It's about 174 thousand square kilometers potentially contaminated lands. Um, you know, when you hear that number, it's like uh, something really abstract. But uh, you can imagine it's like the area of three Japans, for example, three territory of whole, whole Japan. Uh, what to do with such a big amount, with such a huge area of contaminated lands? Sure, we need to open the market for um, demanding companies, and we are trying to do that right now. We are trying to deregulate in order to create this market. Unfortunately, it's not just usual service like I know, I don't know agricultural machinery when you can choose the company, uh, invite it, and you know the competitors who can join, and so on and so far. Uh, the mining is a very, very specific problem where Ukraine right now, unfortunately, creates its best experience. We are trying to use drones, new technologies, satellite imagery in order to facilitate this process as, far, as fast as it can be. Uh, if we speak about agricultural land, today we have about 470,000 hectares of contaminated, potentially contaminated lands, which are uh, which can be demined right now. It's far from front line and uh, it's far from border with uh, Russia. Uh, so, uh, first, as a government, we've conducted we, the plan for prioritizing the demining. We do understand that demining is a matter of uh, the consequences of demining is a matter of economy. We need to demine first the biggest valley added lands like vegetable lands, uh, like greenhouses, and so on. Then we are speaking about just usual uh, uh, lands for commodities, and then pastures and other, other lands. Uh, this year, uh, together with our partners, we've surveyed about uh, this season, I would say, even. We've surveyed about uh, one, uh, 100,000 of hectares, and it's actually returned to usage. And uh, even this year, we already expect to, um, from this lands, the input of, to economy is about 4 billion of hryvnias. 
So you, you see, this, this is the, the matter of the mining, but we do uh, understand the problem of small farms that FAO raised. Uh, a lot of really, really small companies, they can't afford themselves the uh, services of the mining. And uh, it's not only the matter of their, uh, of their uh, productivity, it's a matter of absence of market. So right now, uh, my message is that Ukraine creating uh, a really, really good my, uh, the mining market. And we invite all the American companies, we invite all the international companies to join this market. Because together, uh, frankly speaking, let's, let's look on Croatia. 20 years past the war and the country is still not demand at 100%. The market is, uh, frankly speaking, in Ukraine unlimited right now and the favorable conditions uh, will be created and already created by the government. So, welcome here. Thank you, thank you. Peter. So, the short uh, answer is yes, the mining is in a process, it is kicked off. Uh, Halo Trust, for example, Howard Buffett Foundation, supported by many companies, uh, including John Deere, uh, who are already active. It is a process which will take place, and we just have heard also about uh, the Ukrainian creativity to uh, uh, introduce innovations to accelerate the process. And I think that really uh, deserves a lot of recognition. And what we do believe that yes, this is a long process, but first of all, we need to say yes, it already started and it is a continuous process. And knowing the Ukrainian spirit, um, as I lived there really uh, many years, I believe it will be much faster cleared than we today anticipate. I have a, a follow-up question for our two panelists who've spoken in to, for Timothy and Jim as well. Uh, we may have lost Vasily briefly, but FAO is coming forward with $100 million. There are other uh, NGOs or collaborations. How much is this going to cost? And number one, so it's $100 million, 50% of what's needed, 5% of what's needed. So how much will this really cost? Where's the money going to come from? And what's the timeline we're looking at? What's the goal? Yeah, so uh, if you speak, it's working, yeah. If you speak about how much money is, uh, you know, it's really hard to uh, even understand the average price right now because we are uh, looking on the mining not only for the territories that we have right now. We're looking the mining for the whole country, for Crimea, for Donbas region, and uh, without first surveying, it's really hard to understand. But if you speak about uh, current market uh, of Ukraine's uh, the mining, uh, it, it costs, uh, in average, about five till $600 per hectare of the mining, uh, so you can count about it. But also, we need to understand that it's not only about service works, it's also about uh, buying machine, uh, machines for the mining, uh, and there are a lot of varieties starting from 1 million till 5 million, and it's really hard to buy them because it's not like uh, cereal production, everyone products, you need to uh, you need to request this car and you'll receive it in a year. And it's a huge problem, frankly speaking, because uh, the work has taught us to, be, uh, to react uh, really fast for the challenges that we have. And uh, we cannot wait, and our land cannot wait for a year or two for machine to be productive. And that's why, thanks, you mentioned our creativity, our inner production <coughs> is being developed uh, due to uh, young scientists uh, for hackathons that we conduct together, even with Kiev School of, Co of Economy. So that's it. How long it will take is a good question. I cannot answer this. We don't know what we still will find. I mean, this flood was also, uh, when the dam was breaking, was also, uh, let's say, making all maps where potentially mines have been recorded, documented, these plans are obsolete. So it, it will take time. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the support is uh, great and will be, uh, continue to be great, that the Ukrainians are really continue to be focused on this self-understanding and absolutely clear, it's common sense. I think uh, I would not dare to give a timeline here. Uh, too many variables, 
but I again refer to the uh, spirit of the Ukrainians. Uh, it will be solved and we will have our agricultural land back. Yeah, so, so I want to add some flavor to it. Uh, I was in, uh, in Dnieper region last uh, Wednesday, Thursday, visiting a brigade, uh, a base, um, uh, relatively close to the city. Um, that was about education of military, um, soft skills actually, for coordination. But um, on the way back and forth, um, it was two hours drive, I was amazed by how much agricultural, new agricultural equipment is on sale. So apparently it is working, even close to the front lines. The economy is there, okay? And the fields, not all fields, you know, but the fields, you know, are planted, you know. It's, it's, so the question is how? So I talked to two or three people who are, you know, owners or CEOs of large farms. And I asked them, you know, one of them has 10,000 hectares under mines. So he has maybe 100 or 50 or something. And the other had also 20,000 hectares. So massive. So I asked them, you know, come on, explain it to me what you, and they said we kind of, you know, demined it already. Like, what did you do? I mean, they didn't really demine it fully or legally. So the, but they asked the military informally. Uh, because they are, all of the businesses there are supporters of military, so they have relationships. So they asked military, you know, why they are training on the basis to look at the fields and identify dangerous zones that they avoid, okay? And then, you know, it goes in probabilities then. You say, it's like, what are you concerned when you're doing the mining? You're concerned about uh, false negative, in the sense that you say, listen, there is uh, no mines, that's a negative result, but it's false because there is a mine, there is a trap, there is something, you know, and there are a lot of traps. And uh, Russians are extremely inno innovative in the way they set up the mines. And some of the mines are plastic mines, and I've been on testing grounds. They are not detectable, you know, through the standard means. They have to be, there, are, there are a lot of innovation. In fact, people are trying to scan during sunset, scan the field and see if there are differences in the temperature drops which would be indicative that there is something foreign, some foreign objects, for example, uh, could be plastic. Um, but these guys basically uh, get high enough probability and put uh, some equipment there, cheaper equipment, some of this equipment automatic. So because you're not going to put a human. So we'll see a lot of innovation, not only in the mining and approaches, but we'll see a lot of innovation in the way we do agriculture. Because it is impossible to follow the procedure of the hollow trust, and that's exactly why they're extremely expensive and extremely slow. Because they have to get probability one that there is no mine and no trap. Because they are legally responsible for accidents which might happen. Them together with the certifying authority. So that's a real problem. You basically have two systems now which are fight fighting. One is the legacy system international, which is extremely slow, but 100%. Very expensive, and the numbers we are getting is from that system. Billions of dollars, 100 years, okay? And there are, of course, organizational and political stakes. Some, you know, there's, it's money involved, also overhead, profits. So, you know, the legacy is fighting. Uh, and there is the alternative. People who actually have to work, have to walk to school, have to protect their, I don't know, children from being blown up in the occupied territories. So, you know, what they do, they innovate right now, whether it's certified or not. And the problem with innovation is that it's very different from the drone innovation uh, for military. Because in drone innovation, what's a success? What is an MVP? A thing which can fly and kill. You can blow up something, you're already in the field, you can start experimenting and improve. With the mining, you need to make sure that there is nothing there. No one cares about a little drone which will figure out 10% of the mines. You know, this is not very useful. But everyone cares about little drone which can attack a specific type of equipment of the enemy. You already can deploy it. So the process is very different. The process of innovation has to be much more enabled and supported structurally by institutions, by funds, by... Uh, we're going to run an accelerator at the Kiev School of Economics. We're going to announce it next week in Ukraine. Uh, so please apply. Please, you know, we have to get these things together. It's, it's, a com it's a common goal. Innovation is there, but it is much more challenging exactly because of the structural problem of the false negatives. You don't have that problem with the weapons. You have that problem with the mining. Mm -hmm. 
because it's defense, essentially. So, so the reality is that agricultural companies already figured out a way to get maybe 70, 80% of land back and harvestable, so they're working on this. Not fully legal. The government works on uh, different la layers of certification to get it, you know, to bring it into the regulatory fold, which is normal. That's how things happen during the war. Um, companies are innovating. Tons of teams, tons of spillovers from drones, um, from uh, surveillance, um, intelligence drones, attack drones, actually. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. And I think this winter will be an important time for the innovation cycle. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much. And Vasily, I see we've got you back. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to, to contribute on this topic? I know it's a, a priority Hi. for Cargill. Go ahead. Yes, I, and from, from our side, we are supporting, uh, supporting the, the initiatives, in, including the Hello Trust that everybody mentioned. So it, 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 it's true that one way or the other, uh, I think the alternatives that Ukrainian farmers have today are the ones that have been described. Either we are talking about uh, taking more risks and trying to, to, solve, uh, to solve the issue, which has obviously a big uh, safety uh, exposure attached to it, or you take it uh, the safer, safest way, uh, costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time. But to answer your question, uh, one or the other, don't think. Uh, I, I, I do expect that there, uh, there will be a lot of innovation. Uh, we will learn a lot as we go. But I don't think the mine in Ukraine is a process of one or two years, uh, whether we like it or not. And I'm also sure that uh, $100 million is not going to be enough. My encouragement for, for everybody that wants to play a role uh, in, in this uh, area is that we need to continue contributing and try to find the best alternatives as we, as we go, with the ultimate goal to transfer the land bank back into, into production in the safest way uh, possible. Thank you, Vasily. Okay, this is a conference on rebuilding Ukraine. So we're going to now pivot to how are we going to be rebuilding Ukraine agriculture? The how is not so much where's the money coming from, but rather, what is our vision? What is our focus? Ukraine agriculture is, is world-renowned because it is so uh, productive. It has traditionally been the source of large volumes of globally traded commodities, wheat, corn, sunflower seeds. Because the productivity of the Ukraine farms are so high, people around the world have avoided hunger. And when the war began, there was a significant amount of attention, perhaps for a first time in many parts of the world, of the fact that people are eating in Sudan or in Ethiopia or in large parts of Asia because of the productivity of Ukraine. What are we trying to rebuild? Are we trying to rebuild this large, scale, globally traded commodity with relatively little domestic value added. Is that the agriculture sector we are trying to rebuild? So I'm going to go to Jim and to Timothy and then to the other panelists as well. So Jim. I'll just put a finer point on the uh, enormity of Ukrainian agriculture. Uh, nearly 40% of the world's class one soils are located in the Ukraine. It's just tremendous black soils, uh, tremendous depth of them, has a supportive climate, uh, virtually unlimited in its uh, productive capacity. And if that isn't enough, um, there is no other ag growing region, crop growing region, as close to tidewater. What I mean by that is how far is it from the farmer growing the grain in the field to having on a ship for export this destination. Much of agricultural land is 200 miles or less from the port of Odessa and closer to some other ports. Let's compare it to some other parts of the world. You have northern tier U.S. corn producing states. My home state of Minnesota, 2,400 miles from Minnesota down to export destinations on the Gulf of Mexico. In Canada, western Canadian agriculture, goes mostly uh, westbound to Vancouver, some goes east through Thunder Bay. To get to Vancouver, it's 1,400 miles from Manitoba, 1,200 miles from Saskatchewan. 
only by train, no truck alternative, no river barge alternatives. Mm -hmm. And in Brazil, a powerhouse of the world in oil seed production. It's 800 miles, doesn't sound too far. It's only by, largely by truck, and that takes three days of shipping to get it from a Brazilian soybean farm into the Port of Santos, which is overwhelmed uh, beyond capacity, and it could be another two or three days work, working, uh, waiting in a Brazilian port to get it exported. So to think that a farmer with a farm truck can take three or four hours to deliver their crop to terminals in Odessa is, ju is it, it, it's just an extraordinary opportunity. It lowers the price of the grain, increases the profitability for the farmers, and really makes, a, uh, it makes the Ukrainian agricultural unbeatable. And then the other point you made, there's, Ukraine has a culture of agriculture. It's respected generations. It's probably not more than one or two generations that every Ukrainian had somebody working on a farm or from a farm. It's a respected profession, although I'd say there's probably threats that farmers are getting older, nobody wants to live in the villages, and we're seeing this around the world, China, Brazil, US, Canada. Uh, so that is something that's off into the future. So those are the hard values to uh, benefits of Ukrainian agriculture. And to some degree, it, it, to a large degree, that's necessary but not sufficient. For agriculture to be sustainable and profitable in uh, the Ukraine, you need uh, clear and transparent private property rights. Uh, big progress has been made in the last decade. Rule of law, you have to know where the courthouse steps are. If somebody doesn't pay a bill, you have a land uh, dispute. You have to know where you can go to get this resolved in a trusted manner. Risk management tools. You know, we think of risk management, well, where are you going to get insurance? Well, there's a whole scheme of hedging grains. Uh, a farmer plants a crop in the spring, probably buys the inputs in the winter. You're going to have a tremendous amount of working capital tied up before you might harvest a crop six and eight months later. Uh, so you have to have a banking system, a way to hedge the risk, a way to transact and to get credit. And then logistics and reliability. I talked about the proximity to the Crimea, uh, to the ports in uh, um, the Black Sea. Um, this, uh, it's notable and uh, noteworthy that grain is being moved by rail and truck into uh, uh, Western Europe. That, that, that is a stopgap. That just isn't a viable long-term solution for the vast amounts of grain. Ports in the Black Sea have to be accessible if Ukrainian agriculture is going to really amount to much. And um, finally, the inputs, uh, getting the seed, the new varieties of seeds, productive varieties of seeds, uh, drought-tolerant seeds, uh, pest-tolerant seeds, critical. That, that seems to be getting solved. It seem, I, I, I hear there's not many problems in farmers getting their seed. Uh, getting, the, um, getting the fuel, uh, sounds like that's working. The equipment's running. What is going to be problematic when this war comes to an end is getting the crop nutrients. Nitrogen, Ukraine's self-sufficient and exporter of nitrogen. Phosphate and potash, it comes from the enemy. Belarusia and the Ukraine. Belarusia with the potash, Ukraine with the phosphate, or Russia with the phosphate. Uh, the other producers of potash are Canada. That's just far, too far away to bring uh, economically into the Ukraine. Phosphates, it can come from Florida, it can come from Morocco, it can come from Saudi Arabia, not the most economic way of doing it. So just imagine Moroccan phosphate going north uh, up to through the Black Sea and into the Ukraine, all the while Russian phosphate is moving the other direction to Brazil. So there's natural markets for these various products, but when this is all said and done, uh, we've got to face how we're going to get phosphate and potash to the Ukrainian farms, and that is going to have to be somehow from the Ukrainians. I know who some of these Ukrainian oligarch fertilizer, or uh, Russian oligarch fertilizer producers, they'll be happy to sell. Will the government let them sell? Mm -hmm. So there's uh, a lot of pieces here. It's like a Rubik's Cube. You get this right, you got to get that piece in place. The credit right, all well, the property ownership right, the cash systems, the barter systems. It's a complex process that uh, is remarkable that it's still working given all the pressures it's been put under. Absolutely. It is a Rubik's Cube. And thanks for describing it very well. Timothy? Yeah, thank you. So just I want to make a little uh, humble, if I may, public service announcement that it's Ukraine, not the Ukraine. Sometimes it still slips. 
really upsets us. You know, we can go into a separate linguistic discussion or historical why. Still rubs us real, like we are used to it, but it's not right. Okay, so it's just like whenever, I, I know most of you say Ukraine, please just, okay, yeah, that, that matters to us for whatever reason. Um, happy to discuss it in the break. Um, now, the uh, rebuilding Ukraine. So I think there are two mind, mindset issues I think we are facing. One is that people think there will be a very uh, clear end to the war. Um, there is this assumption that somehow on March 18th of something, there will be a treaty and things will be back to some kind of normal. That might be true that there would be a treaty at some point, but the risks of missiles and escalations are not going to disappear. And we have seen it to, in 2016 how treaties with Russia have worked, whatever the conditions of those treaties are. So it's, it's a more useful thinking to prepare for a more continuous outcomes because in case it's a discrete outcome, it would be better for us, okay? So that's one mindset. The second one, there is the notion of rebuilding Ukraine after the war is over. That is also a little bit of a self-defeating option because we actually need to run economy strong now in order to, for the war to end sooner, you know? Uh, economy matters, and also for food security. You know, as long as there is no food security, Russia can weaponize it, prolonging the war, and I actually create an incentives for them. So I, I understand that it is abstract, but things are going to be much more continuous, and we have to be rebuilding now and maintaining agriculture now, preparing for a longer-term uh, environment in which there are real threats, like air defense. You have to have air defense, you know, over your processing facilities. Okay, there will be the blockade of the ports at some point, but we will have to protect them militarily, those ports. And not only in Ukraine, on the border with Ukraine, in Romania, elsewhere, okay? So, because the risk will be there. Now, the good news, in a sense, if you were really, really zoom out, then Ukraine has been through a lot of wars in the last two, three hundred years. Or more, and it has always been an important player for food security in the world. So it always comes back and recovers, no matter how devastating the wars are. Okay, so Ukraine is there to stay. It's going to happen, but we have to do it. Okay, now what is happening now in the meantime, uh, while Ukraine is being blockaded? Let's look at Turkey. Turkey before the war. Uh, got about 75%, very far, there were other countries, but 75% from Russia of uh, grain and 25% from Ukraine. Now it's still buying from Ukraine and it's buying less from Russia, but it's 50%. Let's look at Tunis. Ukraine was the largest supplier of agriculture to Tunis before the war. Now they were not there. They have not yet substituted their in a specific country in a continuous crisis, food security crisis. If we look um, at, uh, just to get the numbers right, if we look at Indonesia, for example, Ukraine was an important player there, and Ukraine's grain is being substituted by whom? Argentina is coming up, that's a new player. It wasn't there. And then also two new players, which are uh, India and um, um, Brazil. Mm -hmm. They were not really expert in countries before. So things are changing and shaping on the, on the global markets. And in smaller countries, there is a crisis, really. Ukraine is an important food security provider not just philosophically, not just in terms of global markets, but in very specific instances. When I think uh, Qatar was under blockade um, several years ago, Ukraine continued to supply, no matter what the, the conditions were in the region. Ukraine always delivered on the contracts in the Middle East, even though they had their own regional conflicts. And there were lines for bread in these countries. And Ukraine kept supplying grain, wheat. So partly destabilization was avoided of the governments 
because Ukraine delivered. Now Ukraine can't. So food is being weaponized, and Ukraine will have to, and will do it, will, will open up the blockades, but that's not going to be just diplomatic. I'm a game theorist by training, and we, an economist. We know that outside option matters. So our outside option is no grain deal, and military defending the corridors, moving from Odessa elsewhere. So we have to strengthen the military. We have to get convoys there. We have to have patrols. We have to have Romania and other NATO countries to actually become very, very serious, committed, and invested in air defense over the areas. You know, they shouldn't be just thinking that we're going to put an SMS messaging system about drones. They actually have to shut down anything which flies over the new. And they, there are agreements you can set up with Ukraine to create no-fly zones over ports which are close to NATO countries. That has to be done because the entire thing about stability and security in northern and western Black Sea. And that's going to impose pressure not only on Ukraine and on the food security globally, but also on other countries in the region if Russia can dictate and blockade the freedom, deny the freedom of movement uh, in the Black Sea region. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you raised many, many, many issues. Let me turn to our colleague from Cargill and our colleague from John Deere. And then, Dennis, you get the last uh, word on, on this area, which is, what needs to be done to rebuild and reestablish the traditional role that Ukraine played in terms of not only the physical harvest, uh, planting harvest, storage, logistics, but also to reconnect with those customers which have been lost or that they've been displaced by like the Argentinas and Brazils. So start with you, Vasily, over to you, Peter, over to you, Dennis. Yeah, I can be the first one to comment. I, I, I'm not so much concerned about uh, reconnecting with, uh, with uh, uh, our say, external customers because markets do that. Yeah? So from, from this perspective, as soon as the situation in Ukraine normalizes, uh, I'm, I'm more than sure that we can go back and be as successful as we were before in accessing all the destination markets. Uh, that being said, I want to turn a bit behind uh, because in, in, indeed on the question what should be done for, for the, to restore uh, the Ukrainian agriculture, unfortunately the answer is broader. Yeah, we have to focus on restoring the Ukrainian economy altogether. We cannot uh, talk about agriculture in, um, in, uh, in separation. In the end, there is damage everywhere. Yeah, and, and most, of, uh, most of these impacts will hit the farmer as well. We are talking uh, the, the, the hit on the energy infrastructure, uh, the transport uh, the infrastructure as well. Just let's, uh, let's uh, the, remind everybody about the situation uh, with the transportation on the Nipro River. Uh, after the dam on the river exploded, I mean, Ukraine needs to ship uh, more than 10 million tons towards the port via, uh, via the river. This is out, and it's going to take a while before, uh, uh, before uh, uh, it's being restored. Also, and, and, and I think one of the main concerns that I have uh, related to, uh, say, the sustainability of uh, Ukrainian farming is, 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 is the financing. Uh, it's getting tougher and tougher for them to support and, uh, and continue the normal uh, production cycle. And I think this deserves some, some attention, more attention from the, from, uh, from the state or whoever uh, is involved in, uh, in uh, managing these issues with the farming. So, one way or the other, the problem is very broad and uh, it will require a lot of resources uh, uh, to be allocated to solve it. And I don't think we can count only, or say, international donors or, uh, or, or the resources that the Ukrainian state can, uh, can put together. It's also a question of what the private sector can do. And companies like ours, I mean, we stayed next to, 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 the, farming, uh, to the farmers during these uh, difficult years. And we have to, and we plan to stay uh, next to them in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I'm hearing themes that it's not only the, the security of the land, which of course mining is key, but it's financial security. It is the reliability and security of the whole uh, logistics, the ports, the, the rivers. 
Over to you, Peter. So basically, we have mentioned the uh, three big ones which always come immediately into your head. Logistics, deminding, uh, financing. Very clearly, especially for the small and medium-sized farmers, they don't have that easy access as large holdings do have. And it might also lead, the longer the swap is uh, being prolonged, uh, that we get a situation of unintended consolidation, that small farmers have to give up, and suddenly small farmers will be foreigners in their own villages. So this has also huge social implication, which uh, with financing, I think we could tackle. I would like to add one more item, and this is education. And I don't talk about here necessarily education on the university level. I talk very pragmatic about who will be the next operators. Right now, the men are fighting on the front. Um, farmers share with us, we are right now educating, for example, women uh, to operate the tractors. This is a new opportunity, which is actually already pretty much common practice in the US, in the European Union. And this is also strengthening uh, the role of uh, the women uh, in the agricultural sector, which is right now, let's say, more on the marketing side. And that's why education is uh, here also important. Thank you. Thank you. I know that you had mentioned it in your earlier remarks, Jim, about the financing, and I think we should come back to that because uh, that seems to be a, a continuing issue that I hear about as well. Dennis, yeah. tell us how you're going to fix it all yeah, as uh, Deputy Minister of Ag. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I will want to compliment what Timothy said. It is really hard to underestimate the, uh, Ukraine's role in the global food supply. Actually, 6% of uh, global calories consumed is supplied from Ukraine. I like to count it in cookies. Every six cookies from 100 is from Ukraine. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I won't provide you right now some uh, basic numbers of what was Ukraine's agriculture before the war. I think a lot of people know it's uh, like, you know, uh, first in sunflower oil export and so on and so far. Uh, Ukraine's agriculture, frankly speaking, it was a really successful story, but the, and it was like, you know, a comfortable chair for our farmers. But the war has kicked out this comfortable chair, and Ukraine's agriculture is being transformed right now, uh, unfortunately, according to the war uh, issues. We already see that uh, the old model was good, but it doesn't mean that we need to rebuild the same model. It, is, it was not perfect. Right now we see problems in logistics. It's a real bottleneck of uh, Ukraine's agriculture. We really see that the problem is in the absence of processing inside the country. And actually uh, we have strategic plan, plan till 2030 to process about 50% of agricultural grains inside Ukraine. And we want to shift the perception that Ukraine is a breadbasket of the world to the uh, private label world's supplier. It's, you know, like a really strategic um, transformation of agriculture. Also, uh, right now, we can speak about the possibility uh, for Ukraine to become the leader in the fourth industrial re revolution in agriculture. Right now, we already have 300,000 of professional drones operators about 300 and all. And these guys, these veterans after the war, they can become really, really good uh, operators, for example, of agricultural drones. And we can shift these uh, skills to many, many other uh, spheres uh, of our economy. So, uh, unfortunately, due to such a stress circumstances, due to this bloody war, we, we are transforming our agriculture sector. But I think that the strategic vision that we have will be much more successful than it was before the war. There's so much that, that you all have raised. Uh, clearly, war is a tragedy. And uh, one that Ukraine has um, been burdened with and still continues to go forward. Uh, it is also, as you've heard, an opportunity to review and revise and perhaps rebuild in a different way. Um, there's been a theme throughout this conference that kind of goes in and out of various conversations, which is 
what the future looks like should or when Ukraine becomes a member of the EU. So I think for this last uh, part, I'd like to pivot to that concept about what would that look like? What does it look like for Ukraine to become a member of the EU in terms of Ukraine agriculture and opportunity? And what does it mean for the EU to embrace Ukraine as a member? Again, what we've heard, we have an enormous amount of very, very fertile soil adjacent to a political grouping of 446 million people. And these aren't just normal global people. These are rich people, 446 million rich people. When people get wealthier, they like to eat more and varied things. And the GDP of the EU is $16.6 .6 trillion. So there's a lot of people in the EU, I think, who would welcome opening up their economy to this very vibrant breadbasket right next door. There's also people who are in a more um, perhaps tenuous circumstance, uh, or at least a circumstance which would have to adjust should Ukraine and Ukraine agriculture be brought into the EU and what adjustments would, need, would be needed, for example, in the common agriculture policy? Would it exist in this way it is currently? Or would that, if unchanged, would that result in large amounts of money flowing eastward, which would then, I would say, is a political impossibility? So how would this work? Uh, I'm going to start here with you, Vasily, and just go around counterclockwise. So Vasily, you get the first comment. How would this work? Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's a very, very uh, broad topic that I'm, I'm not sure that we can, we can finish in, uh, in the short amount of time that we have uh, at our disposal. Now, uh, let, let's start a little bit with the basic of it and, 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 and how important agriculture for EU has been since uh, its formation uh, last century. And, and consequently, how much money EU is spending uh, or has spent or is spending today on agriculture-related uh, issues. You know, it has always been very dominant. Yeah, I, I remember that in the initial phases of the Union, 60% uh, of the EU budget would be spent on agriculture. Uh, then uh, we went into, uh, into a period where new member members were, uh, were, uh, were accepted. Uh, you know, all the central and eastern uh, uh, bloc of countries have become uh, members. And that changed overall um, uh, the, the image. And I would say to a certain extent also the focus that the EU had on, on agriculture. Sustaining 60% of budget spent on on agriculture was not sustainable. Uh, nowadays, we, we see two things. First of all, this contribution is reduced to something that is more like uh, 30%. And more important, from the EU perspective, we are uh, uh, changing the focus uh, to areas that are more related to decarbonization, climate change, sustainability, uh, rural development, and areas where EU considers that we better spend, uh, spend the, 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 the money to incentivize some of these changes that we that we need uh, or we want to see at EU uh, level in its entire economy, not only uh, not only agriculture. Now, if you put Ukraine on top of that, uh, it's uh, you know there is good news and uh, also difficulties. Yeah, because Ukraine, we keep talking about it, it's massive. Yeah, no matter what form of support uh, EU would agree to put in place for Ukraine, it's going to be extremely big. Uh, uh, and, and that will be my, my first comment. Second comment, I think in the advantage of Ukraine is the fact that we have already, or we had before the war, and I'm sure we can rebuild it to that level, we already have a very well-performing agriculture. The structure of the farm, uh, farming is different. We all know that uh, the quality of the soil is, is, is probably the best in the, in the world. Uh, we have very large, uh, large farms, very advanced farms also in terms of, um, uh, of uh, applied uh, uh, agronomy. But on, on the other side, 
we do not have yet an alignment between the rules and regulations applied in EU and what is uh, available in Ukraine. So, uh, I mean, I have no doubt that Ukraine will will become a member of uh, EU. I I, I think it's it's going to be. Uh, uh, I would not say a tough negotiation, but it needs to be a very uh, serious discussion be, between the EU and uh, and Ukraine on all these issues related to the harmonization of of the legislation. Uh, also, uh, if you look on what were the initial questions that Ukraine has received from from EU after he uh, uh, applied for accelerated accession, they are all related. To items that will relate to the uh, rule of law, uh, corruption, and the improvement of the institutions uh, that uh, uh, with, with Ukraine will have to go through. Uh, on and okay, to finish in a positive note, before I let uh, I let my my colleagues uh, 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 say their own opinions. But overall, I mean, for EU, the fact that we would include uh, one of the major forces, major forces in, uh, in the world uh, today when it comes to grain trading, it can only be uh, uh, a big advantage. I think the EU overall will become more relevant than it is today in the, in, the, in the world market. And I think we can all benefit from that, not only Ukraine, but the rest of the EU members. Thank you. And I'm going to put you in the cautiously optimistic Cam, part of the, the I'm spectrum. I'm optimistic. I, I, I'm very optimistic about oh, the right. prospect, but uh, it is going to be, uh, it's going to be a, a lengthy process. Though. Okay, cautiously optimistic, but optimistic over a long time. That's the column I'll put you in. Okay, Peter. First of all, I also would say that I have no doubt that uh, Ukraine is uh, joining the EU and also this topic uh, around the agrarian sector. I mean, Europe calls Ukraine the European breadbasket. Also, it's already common sense that uh, Ukraine uh, is to be included into the European Union. I think there are two things uh, necessary because the scale of Ukrainian uh, uh, farming potential, I mean, as big as Germany and France together, um, that is indeed remarkable. This is the big elephant. And I think there are two things. First of all, Ukraine needs to, and especially the farmer, needs to understand which kind of bureaucratic uh, elephant each farmer will get. And on the other hand, the European Union needs to understand that the established processes and subsidies and all that what is connected to it generally need to undergo adjustments. And... Uh, that actually the European Union also has to make one or two steps uh, towards uh, Ukraine, otherwise uh, it will not be working. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, talked about these items like transparency and so on, were extremely well covered uh, uh, by Vasily. I just wanted to add this because they are, for me, these two big points. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very important points. Thank you. Jim. Um, don't take this as, this is provocative. I'm not a pessimist about Ukraine joining the EU. I think that'll happen. With perhaps the exception of row crop agriculture. The EU ag policy and EU agriculture is not designed to have Ukrainian agriculture as a partner in the row crop agriculture. Fruits, vegetables, arugula, maybe potatoes, fine. But corn, um, sunflower, it, it, the, the, the enormity of difference between a 50 hectare German farmer and the 600,000 acre corporate farm in the Ukraine, how are you going to make those two square? I'm not sure. Maybe there, there's got to be a workaround here, and uh, it's going to be difficult. Ukraine is more like a Brazilian uh, soybean scale farming, North American larger scale farming, and is not comparable to the European smaller farm prices. Uh, so, yes, EU, Ukraine should be part of the EU. Manufacturing, all other dimensions. Agriculture is going to be the, uh, is going to be tough and you have a lot of European farmers that are going to drive their tractors to Brussels when they don't get what they want and feel threatened by the Ukrainian farmer. And my final comment is, um, if 
there is a trade off. If there's a trade you have to make between vague promises of EU ascension or tanks and missiles, take the tanks and missiles. Because unless, you know, in first things first, Ukraine doesn't need Europe as a food commodity market. The rest of the world's big enough. There's 9 billion people, only 500 million in Europe. The rest of the world will eat everything the Ukraine can produce. And none of this work really matters unless Russia is pushed out of the Ukraine. The tanks and missiles are first and foremost priority. EU's ascension, that will come and has to be worked on. But that's uh, slightly provocative and I'll leave it at that. No, I I appreciate that, and there's also been a discussion on the margins here. What should come first, joining NATO or joining the EU? And uh, I think this, if it's not safe, it's not, you can't farm. All right, Dennis, you're going uh, to solve it now. Yeah, uh, actually, there are no doubts that Ukraine should join the EU. And uh, yeah, we understand all the advantages. So we do understand also all the challenges. Actually, this month we finished self screening of uh, legal framework of Ukraine's agriculture. And uh, what, what do we need to, to join uh, the EU? And actually, from general 49,000 of legal acts and regulatory framework, uh, 18,000 connected to agriculture. So you do understand what's a huge, not only bureaucratic work, it's huge implementary work we should conduct. Yes, it's a challenge, but I think that we, we, we will do that really, really soon. Uh, if you look right now uh, for the situation, uh, what do um, oh, let's let's be frank. Uh, right now, we have some disputes on cross-border territories concerning the export from Ukraine's uh, uh, from Ukraine uh, exporting Ukraine grain. Uh, I see this protest of farmers. Uh, uh, let's imagine Ukraine joins EU. Protests of farmers, a lot of disputes, uh, but uh, then something happens. If we replace uh, Ukraine name to Poland, we will back to 2004 when Poland joined EU and they had the same problems, the same, pro the same protests in Germany, in France, in other countries. But EU is about cooperation. It's cooperation not only on the bureaucratic uh, dimension, it's cooperation in fact in doing business. It's about mixing business. Uh, let's imagine that before the full-scale invasion, uh, invasion, we had no competition, for example, with Poland farmer. We built together storages, we built together processing farm, uh, factories, and so on. We wouldn't have such problems right now that we have with, the, with Ukraine's exports. So, uh, my conclusion is uh, EU accession is a challenge, but it's also a big opportunity for mutual cooperation. It's not like competitors. We should become real business partners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And last quick comment from you, Timothy, because then we're going to go to Q&A, so you yeah, get two minutes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, two minutes. It's going to be 10 or 8 there. Okay, so now... Uh, and, and, and line up if you have a question to people in the audience. Go ahead. So, so the thinking, the way the entire development framework works and the EU accession framework works is by country. The frictions are between countries because we're thinking about it in terms of zero-sum gain. Ukrainian farmers will create competition and push out Polish, Romanian, Bulgarian farmers, okay? And we just don't have a system, similar, we don't have a good security framework, well, international. We also don't have a development framework which will say, okay, how we can turn it into a win-win or common value game. And so here, here is a Polish example. There's, of course, you all read the news. It's supposed to de-escalate shortly. Uh, let's hope it will happen. I think it will happen uh, maybe even today or tomorrow. But the issue is actually storage and infrastructure. Ukraine has to store its grain because it cannot export it. That's the main issue, not the pricing. So Ukrainian farmers and non-Ukrainian farmers get the grain stored in the entire infrastructure close to the border, both on Ukrainian and European side. 
And so when a local farmer comes with seven tons of grain and says, can I just put it in salad? You know, he needs an elevator. Uh, and this thing is packed, okay? And the very same uh, Polish owners of infrastructure, someone would be thinking about, you know, a thousand tons coming from one customer, okay, Ukrainian, but one customer, or, you know, having seven or ten tons from hundreds of customers, which is a better deal. But that's only because Poland also needs this infrastructure. And a creation, that's what I'm pushing, you know, as an idea, a creation of transnational or transborder infrastructure fund initiative, which would build infrastructure to store agricultural products, would benefit both Ukraine and Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, and so on and so forth. Better air defense in the new region would benefit everyone on both sides of the border. Better port capacity would benefit everyone on both sides. So the idea is that we have to shift from thinking, you know, we have a fixed pie into understanding the bottlenecks because neither fundamentally all this area is not, you know, it's not, it's supply, it's excess supply. Excess supply will go outside of Europe or at least outside of Eastern Europe. So it's infrastructure to get that done, which will re resolve this issue. There's, there's subsidies on all the other issues, of course, and everyone has spoken about that. I agree with that. But I think we need to shift the mindset mm -hmm. and integrate it into the Ukraine uh, accession mechanism, maybe in Ukraine facility plan, and so on and so forth, yeah. So I think this is maybe an idea. Pepper. Oh, okay, <laughs> just quick, Vasily, and then we've got some people who, who have yeah, some because questions. Because I, I wanted to comment on the so-called conflict between Ukrainian and EU farmer. Uh, let's not forget one important factor, that this is driven by the war. The only, I mean, ultimately, the EU farmers in the surrounding countries, here we're talking Poland, Romania, Hungary, uh, 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 and Bulgaria, basically, they are complaining about the sudden uh, the appearance of the Ukrainian grain uh, targeting the local consumption and also the impact uh, that uh, the incoming Ukrainian grain had on the infrastructure overall in terms of capacity and pricing. This is driven by the war. Ukraine doesn't need that. Uh, if uh, uh, the seaports will be operational, uh, all these flows going to the Danube, going uh, 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 to Romania, right train or to Hungary, they have no reason to exist. Yeah. And, and ultimately, uh, uh, if uh, the sea uh, flow will be restored, uh, uh, all these uh, quantities will not uh, come all by the sudden in the, in the uh, Romanian or uh, any of these markets. Oh. Also, it's uh, important to state, Ukrainian farmer was, if I may call it like that, in competition with the Romanian farmer even before. I mean, we, we ship, uh, if you look on the regional flows, both Ukraine, obviously, but also Romania, is not shipping on the EU destination. We are competing on the world market as well. And this is not going to go away whether we become members of the EU or not. Okay, I'm going to stop uh, you there, Vasily. We need to get a couple of questions, and then we can all um, gather and work out the solution and have a big celebration when the EU and Ukraine celebrate their accession. Okay, sir, please identify yourself. Thank you, thank you for your patience, Vasily. Is this on? Yeah. Yes, it is. Hi, <clears throat> Scott Sanders, I'm a retired Navy officer. I have about a 10 hectare farm in Maryland. So appreciate your comment, Dennis, about how veterans can use their skills in agriculture. The question is, I think most of this is on the big corporate agriculture. I didn't know if there was another potential focus in the short term where you can on smaller farms especially where you might have some of the soils contaminated some of them not so you can and that's more of an internal food security problem rather than Tunisia Egypt and Turkey world food security process and that way in the short term you also bring in other younger farmers because like in the US I mean, most farmers here in the U.S. look like me, and that, that's not the future of farming. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to get to a younger generation. So I, did, I, I figured Dennis is mainly for you. I didn't know your 
your outlook on a short term and then a long term view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Actually, uh, you're absolutely right. The uh, future food security, domestic food security Ukraine should rely on small farmers. And right now, in order to support them, uh, we do understand that the war affects the, the weakest, the smallest farmers the most. Uh, and right now, all the state programs and 99% of our international uh, partners um, support programs uh, directed only for small farmers. There are no support for big farmers and big agri holdings right now. And when I said that we are going to shift from the uh, bread basket to private label food supply for Europe, I do understand that all these, um, uh, uh, all the processed grain, it should come from big, but all the um, internal, all, all the internal market, all the food comes from uh, to domestic to domestic market comes from small. That is the main idea, and that's why we are supporting small farmers in order to for them to stay alive before the victory. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think each one of the panelists gets half a minute if you have a final intervention. If not, I think I'm just going to ask everybody to give my fellow panelists a, a applause and a wish for success. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.